all the martial arts, the base seems to be very common. It's about footwork. It's about learning the art of uh, uh, giving that bounce to your body, being able to jump. Uh, so uh, the body movement, the focus on your body, which is why we spent a little time in the Kerala where they taught about me payattu. They call by different names, but that the fundamental thing is learn to control your body, control your limbs, give a sense of lightness to your body. Once you learn that, then it is a matter of uh, handling different kinds of weapons. And these fundamentally are stick and then those kind of uh, horns or claws and nails or daggers and swords, they're all uh, similar uh, thing which are all grounded in the basic form of martial art, uh, Niyuddha Kala of Bharat. We get on to the subject of the day, that is martial arts. In that word itself, there are two common. One is martial, which is Yuddha. There's arts to it, kala. So yuddha itself. In can... yuddha, it becomes sevur. <laughs> so it's beautiful because uh, you're going to be having the session in the afternoon by people from military itself, and uh, you will be exposed to what really goes on in a battle. Now, when we talk about niyuddha kala, uh, here it is. Yes, it is an aspect of combat. But here we are focusing on close combat. So on foot, because in battle you could be on tanks or horses and so on. But in Niyuddha Kala, you're focusing more on close combat where the people are on foot close to each other and engaging each other in a duel. And when you take it to a Kala, so the civilization, the beauty lies in how even something which is to be fought, we have made an art out of it. So, there is a Kala aspect also to it. And when you talk about Kala, so when you talk about it from a Kala point of view, and especially something which is so, uh, such a physical activity, it takes you all the way. The spectrum ranges from your own basic fitness to keep your body fit, to your personal satisfaction, you know, like when you overcome your own records or when you overcome your opponent and you feel that satisfaction, yes, I have the strength in me, to a spiritual experience itself. Now, why do we call this a spiritual experience? This is where the aspect of Niyuddha in Bharat comes into play. Because if you want your body to excel, and that has been a beauty that the civilization has understood. That if you want your body to excel, you have to align all the layers of your being. Right from your mind and everything, you have to focus and bring it into alignment to be able to perform. And when you bring it to that kind of alignment, because spiritual experience is all about aligning. So in yoga, you align as per the word yoga, yug. Jug. So, this alignment, join. So, in martial arts, people experience that kind of a spiritual experience as well because everything is so aligned. You have to be totally focused and totally internalized with that aspect. So, this entire range of using an act such as combat also to take you all the way from a routine fitness activity to enjoying a spiritual experience, this is a beauty which you get only when, when it's a kala. Because in a kala, you're actually doing a routine act. You may be stitching many, many stitches or doing strokes. That is a physical routine activity. But inner, your mind is focused on the theme, on the idea, and you're trying to bring out certain expressions. For example, Mahatma Gandhi used to say, spinning the, ch the charka itself was a meditation for him, even though it's part of the weaving kala. Look at it. So that is just one example 
You thought I'll bring out here. Please go ahead. So therefore, uh, we have evolved while we have taken it as a combat. We have also evolved it into an art and it is part of our 64 arts as well. See, the, the aspect is, uh, uh, there are, in India, through the ages, you can see, among the Kala, we have spoken about 64 different Kala. And the key point is, it has not been the same 64 across centuries. What the 64 is always varied and changed. Sometimes it's gone up to 72 and all. But the key point is that this land recognized a variety of Kalas and it was a very skill-based land. And all these skills were trained and honed and practiced and exhibited for the benefit of the civilization repeatedly by different people. That was the underlying factor because when Kalidasa speaks about 64 Kala or somebody else speaks about 64 Kala, each one is not the same list of 64. Each one is different, sometimes partially, sometimes substantially different. But the point is that there is such a large range. And we also have to identify for our times the range of skills that we have. It could be 64, it could be much more too. So, from and why did we form this particular skill of Niyuddha? You have Yuddha, why Niyuddha as well? Because there are different situations which warrant different kinds of tackling. And in Niyuddha, they have focused both on uh, taking care of fighting the threats to one's own physical body. So how do you keep it fit? And that you can do by exercising and an exercise with a, a purpose. And one of the purposes there was also to keep you fit to thwart threats to the society and civilization itself. So always keep the people in a fit condition so that when there are threats to the society, they can stand, they can come up while they by and large will be a peaceful society. When there are threats, you should be able to stand up and defend. For you can be a peaceful society only if you exhibit strength. So you must have the innate strength both in the physical body the mental makeup and the grouping that you are and show the strength to maintain a sense of balance and peace, which is what in war is called the level of no deterrence or deterrence strength. That's important. This was this is not a new war strategy that, that we have in the last few decades or the last century or two. This was being practiced in the land for millennia. And the constant reminders actually today, if you see it, to this aspect where uh, the civilization had emphasized on fit body and a able society, you can see it in uh, the reminders today are our Akhadas. The traditional places where such training is done, uh, North, I think many people are they are familiar with the word Akhadas and all, but if there are people from the South, uh, it is the word Akhada. Uh, are uh, in for Kerala, it is like a kalari, so a place where training is done. And today, we still are fortunate that we have a few of these traditional training centers still left. Now, tracing back the history, therefore, if you see since when have we been practicing this new the kala, it goes back way, way back. All the way, actually, uh, we have put this up as an article. I'll show you where it is. She's just showing it in our website. All of you can go anytime at your convenience later in Bharat Gyan. We put the same, the, the, the substance of what we are going to, what we're speaking the, the next hour and a half, it's there in, in our website. Just go to the bharatgyan.com website. We're showing you how to get there itself so that you can do it next time as well. So go to our website. Here you will find the blog. So you search on Niyuddha. So you get to Niyuddha Kala there. The full article uh, that explains the whole process. And, and if you look at it, one of the earliest practitioners of this Niyuddha Kala. So one of the earliest practitioners of, his, of this Niyuddha Kala. You see, we can trace it all the way back to Parshurama. You know, or trace it. Get traced all the way back to Parshurama. See, Parshurama, what is the legend of Parshurama? He got the Malabar and the Konkan region. He retrieved the region, the Malabar and the Konkan region. Isn't it? For all of us. 
so that's why that area is called uh, Parasharama Kshetra. Even though when you do Sankalpa, for different places on the land, we have different Kshetra. For the Malapar and Konkan region, we call them Parasharama Kshetra. Of course, now the tourism department has, uh, has called it God's own country. They adapted it well to be appreciated. But fundamentally, that is, that's a Kshetra. What did he do after he created the Parashrama Shastra? See, obviously, Parashrama has got a Kshatriya Bhava. He created 108 salary centers. Means the centers for where you have these practices of martial arts. He created them in Kerala, uh, which is present-day Kerala. So, and many of them actually even now exist from those Hori times. Now, if you see the times for Rama is about 7,100 years ago. So, it means Parshama, see, Parshama makes his last appearance in, in Rama's time and then he is off after that. So, that means this goes back even before that. So, we have a Hori tradition, a practice in this land of this martial arts going back 7,100 years plus. I don't think any other civilization is able to trace its antiquity of different art forms. Let's leave that for the moment. Let's focus on our subject of martial arts and see very clearly a continuity of tradition from there on. Now the point is, where all did Parsharama go around? Obviously, he went to Janakpuri. It's all there, the story of Ramayana. He went all over different parts of the land and wherever he went, he set up these Akada centers. That's been one thing that he has done. And not only has he traveled in this main part of Bharat, he's got all the way up to northeast. In the almost easternmost district of Arunachal Pradesh, you have a nice kund, uh, Sarovar. It's called Parsharam Kund. And it was in this Parshuram Kund that Parshuram did tapas during Shankranti in his times. Which is why even now, every year for Shankranti, lot of people, Yatris, go all the way out to Parshuram Kund, even though it's very cold then. In Arunachal Pradesh, uh, northeast part of India, it's very cold in Shankranti. But still people go there to do Dhyana, and Parsham. So that speaks about what? The range of the land from southwest border of Bharat, Varsha, where he retrieved the land for us and called it Parsham Kshetra, to Parsham Kund in northeast Arunachal Pradesh. He has traversed the land all over, setting up different kalari or akadas, and is now called in different uh, languages. That is how he created a base for it. So if you, today, if you have this vibrant martial arts in this land, I think one of the early, early, early proponents whom we must all offer our obeisance to is Lord Parshurama. So from Parshurama, if you come down next, you will find that the next epoch, a milestone epoch, has been the Mahabharata. So from Ramayana period and pre-Ramayana, the next epoch, if you see, is the Mahabharata times. And we have so many anecdotes in the Mahabharata about duels that have been fought. And one of the earliest, even though it is not directly in Mahabharata, but is of the same contemporaneous period, but finds mention in Bhagavatam and all of that is the engagement of Krishna and Balarama in duel with Kamsa and his warriors. So Chanura and Mushtika, how uh, uh, Krishna and Balarama fought when they were young with these people. And that was also a combat which is recorded. And mind you, the reason we can use this is because these are our documents of history. They, are our, they form part of our Itihasa, the Mahabharata period. We have called them Itihasa. I'm sure you would have had sessions earlier which uh, emphasize this aspect of the knowledge base of the Indian knowledge system, which, is, uh, which are its historical, traditional historical texts, which have been called Itihasa. 
मीनिंग इति हा सा असा इट दस हैपन सो विच मीन्स दैट दे वेर पीपल कृष्णा एंड बलरामा हु एंगेज इन सच नियुद्ध कला एंड महाभारता वी कैन ट्रेस इट द टाइमिंग ऑफ द महाभारता पीरियड वी कैन ट्रेस इट टू एटलीस्ट फाइव थाउजेंड वन हंड्रेड ईयर्स अगो एंड दे फोर फ्रॉम देन ऑन इट हैज बीन कमिंग एंड वी हैव not only krishna and balarama but we have even in the amongst the pandava and kaurava we have bhima and we have uh, duryodhana who were all uh, extolled for their immense strength see niyuddha kala needs strength and uh, while some of them are very subtle and need a light body some of them really need uh, strong well built people as well and strength is therefore core and it is very very interesting that if you go to many of the akhadas uh, one of the divinities one of the main popular divinities in all of the akhadas will not be your warrior god skanda that is or kartikeya or the god who is very huge like ganesha with his elephant head but it will be hanuman and this is the beauty in indian knowledge system you know we may talk about niyuddha we may talk about kala we may talk about itihasa they all blend together because they all each one fits in with the other and reinforces the other and where do you find the reinforcement for using hanuman as a divinity because hanuman if you see yes you have all the vanara and hanuman who have engaged in a uh, lot of their uh, uh, kind of uh, fights we call them just as fights or vanara fights when they fought for rama and uh, lanka but why particularly hanuman and how do you see the association you see that very beautifully in the shloka for hanuman where you extol the uh, traits of hanuman and then you say buddhir balam yasho dhairyam nirbhayatvam arogatam ajatyam vaatpatutvam cha hanuman smaranat bhavet so balam dhairyam nirbhayam so all these qualities this is separate you even today so many of us when we pray to hanuman uh, we go to the temple we utter this shloka we say this shloka we pray to him with this shloka and all these words come in and all of us even today encourage our children to say the shloka for getting all these qualities which are definitely very essential for a martial art person and uh, hanuman and his uh, control over mind and the speed of mind uh, is hanuman uh, embodies that particular aspect as well and niyuddha kala martial arts is everything to do with controlling the mind and the body together and anchoring them together to give you that strength to uh, make the impact now having said about hanuman let's look at the kings of hanuma that is vali and sugriva they were also very skilled in this art of physical combat which is what they had a personal physical combat which all of us have heard about the vali sugriva yuddha so it has been a regular training across millennia not centuries across millennia but look at the other part of it what do we call to go to olympics or international sport wrestling today is called by the greco roman style the style of wrestling itself they call that but they don't call it anymore indian style of wrestling whereas wrestling malyuddha is something that we have offered the world before those civilizations became civilized in the first place this is 3 4 5 millennia before the greco roman civilization formed itself we have been having rules and methods and trainings and practices for wrestling akadas and kalari and all that but we don't have that name in international sport calling it indian style of wrestling whereas you call it greco roman style of wrestling that is something through these efforts we need to change no use saying what happened 40 50 years back but it's sufficient time that we all look at the idea and then change and say okay did we have an interesting indian style and we have the tradition for it and with the data to to back it that's what is important yeah. so from the mahabharata period 
we then come to a period where we find all this martial art traveling actually from india so uh, he was hari was just mentioning about how we need to bring this particular aspect of uh, indian style of wrestling and these indian martial arts they actually have traveled the world over especially to southeast and one of the main personages who was responsible for this is bodhi dharma and this bodhi dharma he was a pallava prince so he was a pallava prince and he lived during this uh, 5th century ce so pallava fundamentally meaning this part of south india and from here so he lived in kanchipuram and he was trained in kalari by uh, gurus from kerala and from here he has traveled made his journey all the way to uh, so he was also a buddhist scholar and uh, he wanted to take buddhism his main objective his purpose was to take buddhism and spread it to uh, southeast asia china and that is why he, his aim was to travel to china and this was the route he take, took he went along malacca strait went to vietnam and he spent if he spent a few months in vietnam teaching martial arts there and he was known as bodhi that ma look at the name he gets he had a he, he had a different name in india of course he was a pallava royal prince so he was a varma in india uh, and then from there he went he, he took so this name was mentioned different ways whereas in china he is known as damo and uh, in korea he is even though he did not go to korea his skills went to korea his teachings went to korea that became dalma then in japan it became daruma so while he settled down in shaolin his skills from there on went westwards and came all the way up to tibet as uh, dharmottara Look at the word. So, so it's all related to dharma. See, while from Kanchipuram up north, he did not go into Tibet. Of course, he went up to Nalanda and studied all that. But his fame came all the way from Shawolin. So that's how it came through. And instantly, we have written a book on this. It's available in our uh, uh, site for all of you for free reading. So, if you go to our mini book section again, you will find this on Bodhi Dharma. So, this this book talks about how he took martial arts. who was he and his background and how he took this entire so like we said in the earlier part about dhyanam so from dhyanam it became dhyan and then it became chan look at that in india some part is called dhyanam some part is called dhyan when bodhi dharma took it to china what did they call it they called it chan in, in chinese language and from china when this went to japan it became zen buddhism so today when we speak about zen buddhism so it is that it came from this particular idea so he goes to shaolin and there he emphasizes so while he has gone there to spread buddhism teach buddhism he also emphasizes that it is not enough to have just spiritual meditative uh, form of lifestyle but you should also have physical activity to build your fitness as well and keep yourself as a fit society because china uh, at the time there were a lot of group uh, different clans as well uh, trying to uh, having engaging in uh, taking over each other's villages and so on so he was he was teaching people how to be a fit and uh, secure group so for towards this purpose he taught them the martial arts that he was an exponent in and uh, that is how he set up shaolin so he was given the land to set up the shaolin monastery and he, prior to that he proved his metal by uh, he himself sitting and meditating and uh, at, there is a cave which is called the dharma cave bodhi dharma cave so in this we have detailed and you can read this later at your leisure so that's how they normally show him they show him sitting there in meditation so he proved he had both the spiritual the dhyana skill and the skill of techniques of martial arts so how he convinces the emperor and that's how he gets it uh, and there is a monument for him at the place uh, even today there is a temple for him specifically now for this particular which is looked at as the the high place for martial arts 
while we don't have a similar pagoda in india china has it that's a, so they are taking it up so what is a skill of bharat china has gone and owned it today this we need to own back first the three levels to it one we need to know about it then we need to own it because only if we know something can we own it only if you own it can we flaunt it we can speak about it so there are three unfortunately we have not we have stumbled a lot not a bit but we have to get back to know of it to all these ik sessions like this then own it then only you can say that yes we have it if you don't say they will give others names to it and there is a very interesting story as to how this style of namaste which is popular in bharat goes and becomes the style of a single handed uh, greeting uh, in shaolin that is the way they greet people in shaolin and in martial arts in china with a single hand with just one handed namaste so if you see bodhi dharma the place from which he embarked on his journey to china was mahabalipuram uh, which is there in present day tamil nadu very close to chennai uh, it is a coastal town and the name for mahabalipuram in tamil is mamallapuram and mamallapuram again this comes from one of the pallava kings who was a great exponent in martial arts and he was so therefore malla he was a ma malla maha malla so, mal yuddha we we say mal yuddha the same mal you prefix it with a ma meaning great maha great so he was a ma malla so the king had a had a prefix a royal name called ma malla and the city that he built the port city built came to be called as ma malla puram so that was the importance it was given to so this this is the place today you have an ancient shore temple which stands there as a port city because it was also a very very important center then there were parallel uh, trade ports just along close by and uh, there are a few temples today it's a very popular visiting site and the most interesting thing is china recognizes that this art has come from india and uh, that is why when the chinese premier Xi Jinping came to India. He chose Mahabalipuram as the venue for his meeting with Prime Minister Modi. Actually, we have made a short film on this. It's in a YouTube channel for you to watch later. See, when when Xi Jinping, the president, came to India of China, he chose to come to Mahabalipuram, Mahamallapuram, because he felt that is they were their their roots are. So while we have to exhibit our roots, whereas they wanted to claim that root. That's the beauty of it between the two civilizations. Look at this. clear sculptures of wrestling that we have here so from here actually let's look at some more of the various art forms so from there on things have propagated and today if you really look at it we have various forms of styles which are particular to various regions of india so if you look at the northwest we have so we we will start we will look at different regions so fundamentally the point actually at this point what we want to emphasize to you is that there is a great history of martial arts which which goes back to parshurama times and we can see the trail all the way up to bodhi dharma who takes it from india to other parts of the world as well so we have got, come thus far now what has happened within india do we where all do we see traces of it and when we talk about martial arts while we use the word niyuddha we use the generic term mal yuddha there are various variations and varieties of this see when we talk about war yuddha there are two words that come uh, popularly which are used one is the weaponry that is used in yuddha and that is astra and shastra right we all are familiar with the words astra and shastra mahabharata is uh, full of uh, these words what is the difference why do we have two words astra and shastra so astra are missiles those which are projectiles they are sent out from one place and they go and cause a damage or inflict injury or effect 
in another place. So that's a it's a projectile. It's projected, and it's projected with a clear focus and with a definite target to hit. Shastra are those which are held in hand and fought. So these are weapons which are handheld weapons. You could be like sword, spear, bows, arrows. These are called shastra fundamentally. And even within shastra, we have varieties which are that can be held, which can also be flung. So things they are called mukta. So those which can be freed from your hand and thrown away. And a mukta, those which cannot be thrown, which cannot be freed and have to be held only in the hand and fought accordingly. You can't just throw a sword. You have to hold it in your hand and fight. Where there's a spear, you can throw it. You can hold it in your hand and fight. You can also just uh, throw it. And when you throw it, you can throw it in many ways. There are things which are called mantra mukta, which have been discharged by mantra. And you have yantra mukta, discharged by machines. So things like catapults or, uh, or tanks, uh, cannons, which, which can release the ball. And uh, so there is a device which you use to uh, release the particular weapon. So the, this is all there in Dhanur Veda. Uh, one fundamental aspect uh, which we should bear in mind when we are trying to study uh, the traditional Indian martial arts. See, it's very easy to write about a science, about a philosophy, and you can write pages and pages and explain the idea. But when it comes to activity, how do you write and explain about an idea? You can write about the sciences. You can write about the classification. You can write about the category. You can write about the objectives. You can write about the purpose. You can write certain, certain uh, tips about uh, various guidelines. But the actual technique, you cannot write it down. How much will you illustrate? It has to be learned in a Guru Sishya Parampara only. So a Kala is that which transcends time and comes down to you. It is a perfected art and comes down to you fundamentally by transcending generations as well. By transcending many brains, many mouths, many bodies. So different, different gurus from each guru to Sishya, Sishya, Sishya becomes a guru, then to his Sishya. So unless you have a Guru Sishya Parampara which is established and is functioning and flourishing very well, you will not be able to sustain arts, any form of art. So any Kala to be sustained needs that kind of a Guru Sishya Parampara because it has to be demonstrated, it has to be physically taught. Even online, it's today we are uh, fortunate to have certain uh, mechanisms like the online systems that help us teach various art forms. But even then, you still need that guru's presence, close enough presence to own it to a finesse. And therefore, we have various texts. So, Dhanur Veda is one such text, but which talks about the overall aspects of these kind of warfare techniques. But the actual way, the skill has to be learned from a Guru Sishya Parampara. And that is where we have had many such. Every Akhada, therefore, is one of that example of that Guru Sishya Parampara, which has been coming for so many years and has been, therefore, imparting this kind of training. A Akhada or a Kalari is that kind of a place where uh, you have this. And based on all of this is where we have. So from there, you have various varieties that have developed in India and uh, we shall see a few of them. So if you start from the Northwest, so Punjab, you have the Gatka. This is the, the famous art form that we have there in Punjab, which is there. Similarly, so, so Shastra Vidya is, is also in, is so important. The practitioners of Punjab have practiced it so well. Unfortunately, all these art forms were banned during the British colonial rule of India is what we should take. Now, all the Vidya, all these Vidyas are banned because they felt it will be 
inimical to their rule of the land because these people are well trained Kshatriya Bhava and then they'll be able to bring out aggression against the British rule. So they banned all these things. So we have some manuscripts too, and they took all. Not only did they do that, they took away most of the manuscripts of training because they didn't want it to lie in India. They are, most of the manuscripts are now in the British Museum there. So that's how it happened. Now look at the other places. For example, you look at Maharashtra, which is again a vibrant form of this cave, which is called as Mardani cave. Obviously, popularized a lot during the times of Chhatrapati Shivaji and others, during the Maratha rule. It became quite popular. And all the Maratha men and women, they carried out this, trade, this training as a self-defense. That's the beauty of it. And it encouraged them to create a large physically strong body of people across the hinterland of the whole Maratha region. And we come to Odisha. We all hear about the Paika Akhada. The famous traditional Akhadas which are practiced there. So it's popular among the youth of the land. It was very popular among the youth of the land. Which is what the Paika revolution itself took place it was before the 1857 war. So you had these people happening all over. So let's look at Tamil Nadu again. This here the, we have the famous idea of silambam, fighting with the stick, with a st strong bamboo stick. So silambam has been a very popular uh, art form and the yuddha form very clearly. And you had of course protective gear, and then this was this became a rahasya kala because the British had banned it. Again, look at that; they banned it not only in Tamil Nadu, they banned it in Punjab, they banned it in the in Odisha, all over. So we lost a tradition because of a 200-year ban. And similarly, if you see in Tamil Nadu also, in there when you practice spirituality, you need to practice how to take in pain, how to handle self-defense. So this was, this was one of the great areas of teaching. And uh, starting from Dandal, a variety of other ways of training has taken place where you do different poses like a frog, like a snake, all those things. So different poses, all these things have been well taught and trained in this land. So coming to a place, Kerala, where there is there are still, you can see, a lot of kalari. So the kalari is the, is the equivalent of a nakada, a gymnasium school. And payate are the fights, the practices that go on. And this is where uh, Bodhi Dharma learned his... Uh, martial art and he learns it from a Damu Gurukal and the, this, see all this interesting data we are today able to find in Shaolin Temple. So about Bodhidharma learning this from Damu Gurukal, it's a data we get from Shaolin Temple, not from Indian records. So that's it. So all the modern techniques, what you call Kung Fu, all this comes, evolves from here. Kalari, Payuttu. And who set up these first calories is what you have to see. 108 calories were set up by Parshurama at least 6 millennia before Bodhidharma's time. And look at the continuity that has come down through the ages in actual practice. It's a practice that has survived the onslaught of time for 6 millennia is something that must be venerated by us. Really. And uh, in uh, stages of Kalari again, so when they teach you martial arts, so this aspect of this Guru Sishya, the Sishya Parampara, Guru Sishya Parampara, what they teach you are things like exercises to control the body. So May Payat, Payat is the exercise, May is the body. So how do you, what are the exercises that help you control the body? Then Chartam, Chartam means to jump. So, chartangal, how, how do you do the jumps? And footwork, chavitis, the foot movements, how you should keep your foot so that you can balance your body well. And these are tips that only a guru can teach you that just keep it slightly tilted this way, that way, then you get this balance. So, all of these only a guru can teach you so, physically when you are close to him. So, kala is not only a dance form. That's why martial arts also is a kala because all the footwork, the movement, the body movement, everything comes in that. Each of it adds. Suppose when you play football or cricket, no, they don't teach you how to have the stance, how to bend forward to defend the ball, drive the ball, cut the ball 
like that. Equally important or even more important is here because this all, all got to do with life and death. This martial arts. Even more important. Every nuance is important. And then Vadivu, which are the postures or the forms. Vadivu means forms. And then they go into at least eight uh, specific postures. That of an elephant, of a horse. So how do you position your body? Because these are animals. Fundamentally, all of these, it's so beautiful. We have learned from nature, looking at nature. We look at animals, how they pounce, how they move. And we try to take up similar stances to be able to behave like them, jump like them and uh, engage in that kind of a combat. See, because all animals know how to defend themselves and also how to attack. It's innate to them. And each of them have the distinct methods of doing it, distinct postures of doing it. And, and all of them, while they can also be soft, they can also be ferocious too, very ferocious. So, what we have done, our ancestors, right from Parashurama days is, they observe the animals, how they defend themselves and how they pounce on others. And they point us from these aspects of nature. And even a fish knows how to attack. A, a hen, okay, a rooster, a, a varaha, like a cat. Everyone they took and they took pointers from them, built on it into the system of the art of coloring. That's the beauty of look at this. And then uh, how do you fight? So it, in in a coloring. So when we talk about martial arts, one it is about your body, how to first. Uh, control and the movements of your body, make it light. So whether you're holding weapons or fighting bare hand, uh, it is important to be able to keep your body light and be able to balance with foot, be able to jump to gain advantages. So all of that fundamental comes for whether whichever form of martial art, these kind of activities become very important. Then you need to look at the kind of weapon that you're going to use. Sometimes, yes, you may uh, decide to fight barehanded itself. You have wrestling, kusti, then you have malyudha. You also have a form in uh, Uttar Pradesh which is used uh, and today it has evolved into the style which is called boxing because this is called mukki. So, uh, hitting with your wrist, mushti, mukki, they're all with wrist. And uh, today also if you go to... Uh, the Mysore Palace, you will find claws of uh, Shivaji, uh, tiger claws. People used to not just use mukki like this, but they could also use uh, certain uh, claws over here when they do their uh, uh, wrestling. And uh, so therefore, when you then decide to use sticks as your weapon, so kol dari, so fighting with sticks, then ankadari, so, using metal weapons like daggers and swords, so pointy weapons, so ankadari, then uh, then verum kai prayogam, it's called. That means just only using your hands. Bare hands. Using hands. bare hands. And look at this. Apart from this, what in you is what? The 108 marma points, which can which are there in our body, which can disable or kill a person. That's why it's called marma kala. What does the word marma mean? That is not which is seen, which is secret. Marma, okay, that which is gupta, not seen. So, this was the point. So, they knew in the body where they are. And when you, especially when you do the virum kai prayogam, what do you do? You have your fingers available to go touch or hurt those points, which is what Bodhidharma had learned, which he took it there. Which is what is he? So, they knew these points. And then they took it there. And from which this marmakala, you get two varieties of treatment in Ayurveda. One is called in China. Of course, the name I'm doing, English name, and we'll get back to the Ayurvedic name. One is called acupuncture. Other is called acupressure. That's the English anglicized form of saying it. But one is acupuncture, what do we call it in? In our martial art forms and traditional uh, treatment forms of Ayurveda, we call it Suchi Ayurveda. Because in acupressure, you use a needle, a Suchi, puncture. a puncture. So it's called Suchi Ayurveda. And 
Akupreshat, we call it Marma Sthana Ayurveda. So you know those sthana, those places, which is not seen, is gupt, but you know where it is, so you know how to approach it to either maim a person, hurt a person, immobilize a person, or even treat a person. So it's got both. It's got qualities to immobilize a person. It's also got qualities to treat a person. So that is what the nerve endings are doing. So that is what they, so they are identified this 108. This was part of the training. So you, you had to be also a good Marmastana Ayurveda specialist to be able to excel in coloring. So you find that when we talk about martial arts, it is not just only about fighting and it is an integrated and it's not a separate discipline as well. It is an integrated aspect of the art, Kala and also of all these sciences, the science of Ayurveda, the science of keeping yourself fit. So various other aspects also come into uh, play. Okay, we are showing you some of the paintings. This is a, it's a great guru by name Lakshmanan teaching, teaching how to fight. Because we spoke about the, the different jumpings just a minute back. So you can see that. And there are different types of in the body. So he, you know, the, the Marma Prayoga and to whom will a teacher teach it? That's very important. A teacher will teach this Marma Stana techniques only to a student whom he is convinced will not misuse it ever in his life, abuse it because he's a, he's a really Gupta Gya and has to be used only in that perspective. So that, so only after somebody reached the mental state, was it even taught to them as to what these are. So the grades of levels of teaching, that's so a big the, Here, therefore, this highlights one particular point here. It highlights the aspect that when you are teaching these kind of martial arts, even more important it is to teach good values, dharma to the practitioner. So it is not sufficient that you go for an arts class and you just learn these techniques and come back home and practice and become an expert. But parallelly, there has to be an avenue where the person who is getting trained is exposed to the ideas, the philosophy of the land, the dharma of the land, the principles of good living, so that they don't misuse this particular art. That is very, very important. And that was fulfilled actually by a composite environment of a Gurukula. So people would go. So even when you say Akhadas and all, they still, they would go and live there. And they would go and live there with the Guru who would also impart these value-based uh, training about what is the dharma of the land, what is the ethos of the land, what are the principles by which one should live, when should one use this, when not to. All of this has to go. Only then you become a mature person and capable of being able to put this art to use. So it goes back, this idea of color printing goes back many centuries. You can see, so it was traditional, physical, mental and an art. So it was both bare hands as well as wielding weapons. It was a scientific method of training. It was Vigyana. While it was a Kala, it was also a Vigyana. And it gave rise to all the so-called art forms all over the uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia and other parts of the world. And we have already seen about how Bodhi Tama, Bodhi Dharma, he took it there and he brought forth all these art forms for all of us, the world to see now. So look at the word, when you say the word karate, it comes from the word karam, hand. So that's how it has sort of developed. Across and uh, there is a beautiful art form in uh, uh, South India, which is called Kara Tandavam. So it is a dance and also with karam. So where the hand and hand movements, so karam gets more focused. The strength of the karam is displayed here. And at the same time, it is a Tandavam. It is a Nritya as well. Because all of you know Tandavam of Shiva, isn't it? The, the Tandava Nritya of Tiva, Shiva. That is, he's got two types. One is Ugra Tandavam. Other is Ananda Tandavam. I'm sure uh, the famous Nataraja 
bronze icons we see what, what you call as the chola icons i'm sure all of you are well aware of them uh, the famous the circular round ones where where nata raja the king of natanam natya is there nata raja and two types ugra tandavam ananda tandavam but whereas when you hear you talking about the ugra tandavam when you say kara tandavam it is because using the hands karam it has as your steps are there balanced steps you see to fight so that is how it comes about the term now this is the so holistic form for both the mind and the body that's why if you look at some of the shaolin films you see they speak so much about the mind which was something new to the western world 50 years ago because so much about all this comes from here and it's a combat area and this is mentioned in the sangam literature not only in the north but in the tamil sangam literature too it goes back by about 5 millennia look at the beautiful art form that it bring about the training the, the grappling the kicking the leaping how they have to, so they have both weapons as well as danda the stick both they use both to, to do this and it's a harmony mind you what is important is couple of years back one of the exponents a lady uh from kerala she was awarded the padma shri so that's how it, it is so it's so many people now learning this as an art form it's become because now it's not used so much in direct one on one combat which is was centuries ago it's become an art form the beauty of it. a lot of youngsters have got into learning this because it's all a balance of body and mind that is what it's bringing about a lot of youngsters and you talk about this particular calorie fight the way we for uh, bow and arrow all of us speak about arjuna of the mahabharata as the best wielder of the arrow that's why the sports award today sporting award by by india independent india is called the arjuna award because we say among the archers the best archer was arjuna of course there could be other equally good archers too like ekalavya karna and so many more people but for certain reasons we have eulogized uh, arjuna and said it's arjuna award not just for archery but for sports in general itself similarly for the purpose of kalari pai to the great name equivalent to say arjuna for archery for this is called tacholi othanan who lived in north kerala about 500 years ago he was a great exponent of this particular art unfortunately due to some intestine uh, fights he did not live long he died by the age of 32 but there is even a temple there and he is considered one of the great experts of the art. incidentally about him and his skills which are folklore legends in especially north kerala amar chitra katha about 40 years back brought out a nice uh, illustrated uh, story book about him that you can uh, please check out sometime later it's very well written book i thought about him and there in films made about tacholi othanan 50 years ago okay so the, so there's a great people like that who that tacholi othanan used it within his was late whereas later look at this this great king called parasai raja of kerala he fought with these skills these techniques against the british he rebelled against the british rule that's why the british banned the kalari weapons because they felt and then it could not be taught up because they felt that it is these people who are instigating freedom struggle movements so what happened was then teaching this went underground literally so there were great uh, teachers who taught who continued the skills of training because it, otherwise it would die within a generation the skills will die within a generation because it has to be as she had said some time back you can have some scriptures some writings <clears throat> which are there but which are all taken away back to england because they didn't want to leave them here so it had to be taught literally hand to mouth or mouth to hand so these teachers taught these to and kept it alive for us to know that such a great tradition exists in this land but one of the people who effectively used it against the british hegemony was this particular great raja of the malabar region who hmm? and look at this she is a padma shri awardee she is a grand old lady of kalari pai to at the age of 70 she is tra still training herself and so many more people so 
the good point is recognition is coming back for our martial arts in our own way our own beautiful way that's the beauty of it it's just coming back now i'll just show you one more example here so this this is this another form of when look at the emphasis on the footwork for people here that's what it's a thing is preliminary training somehow it's got lost here so when this has gone all over the world and look at the name it's got it's got the chinese martial arts today it's called jujutsu and this is traceable to the sanskrit word yuyutsu yuyutsu where it means that those who are keen who are whoever desire to fight to engage in a fight who are uh, eager to fight to settle things and get into a mode of fighting yuyutsu so this is how jujutsu is practiced today i mean this is the form of art martial art many of us know about it so wishing to fight dharma kshetre kurukshetra samaveta yuyutsva so people who were eagerly it was a kurukshetra it was a dharma kshetra in kurukshetra where you found all the people waiting ready to fight so a combatant so the 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 chinese term jujutsu or the eastern term jujutsu clearly has the terminology itself the roots in our indian word which finds mention very clearly in the first first shloka of our bhagavad gita so on this we have made a short film we'll share it with you on uh, yujutsu it's a just a, a two minute film india and karate jujutsu martial arts india has also been a land that has offered many different kinds of contact sports the word karate comes from the root word kra meaning to do and karam for hands in sanskrit karate is indeed a sport played with limbs hands mainly karam karate involves using certain spots on the limbs where power can be focused to deliver impact on the opponent the famous japanese martial art the name jujutsu has its origins in the sanskrit word Yuyutsuhu which means desire mentality to fight the word yuyutsuhu draws its root from the sanskrit word yuddha for fight in the medieval period around 760 CE there was a great buddhist monk by the name bodhidharma who traveled from south india over the seas to china his objective was to spread buddhism along with the knowledge of meditation or dhyan which became chan in china and zen in japan giving rise to zen buddhism bodhi dharma is described as having learned kalari priyatu an indian parent form of martial arts it is from this and the yoga mudra and positions that kung fu and other martial art forms are described as having evolved when bodhi dharma stayed and taught at shaolin Tacholi Uttenan from Kerala being the most renowned practitioner of Kalari Payattu in Indian history. Kalari means gymnasium school. Payattu means exercise, fights. Another parent form of Indian contact sports is Kara Tandavam, a martial art form which is a dance of the limb. Kara is hands and Tandavam is the ultimate dance. Thus, Modi Dharma took this knowledge with him to China and from there it spread to Japan and Southeast Asia and developed into further variants there like karate, jujutsu, etc. From there it spread further world over. Some of these continued with just their hands while some others included weapons or other implements as time evolved. So, so you can see from this, there's a, there's a short film for all of you to share with, uh, with people you want to. about how in a in a capsule of two minutes you try to explain so many components of it for all of us to know uh, we will just show you one more bit of it see in one of the other contact sports as you call martial arts is a very famous sport between a bull and and the man it's called jalli katti nowadays i'm sure it was the news for all the wrong reasons about 3 4 years back that's why i want to tell you what it is look at the word jalli cut of course it's a, it's a much more anglicized name now but the original name was salli salli means coins and cut means tie so it was the coins precious coins gold coins silver all all of them 
were tied to the uh, to the horn of the bull so it was important for a person not to hurt the bull not to kill the bull as in the spanish game of matador but here it was very clearly to get control of the bull by only holding its hump the beauty of all the indian bulls is what the hump if you look at this there are various types of bulls in the world one of them is called bos indicus bos comes from the bovine for cow for the genre of cows okay there is other called bos zebu and then there is there is a bos that is the taurus which is there in turkey uh it is there in iraq and turkey that so what you have in the european cows are all bos taurus where they don't have a hump almost all the indian cows have a pronounced hump that's why if you see the nandi in any shiva temple has a clear hump that is the speciality of an indian bull so you tamed an indian bull by holding its hump but not hurting it okay that was the beauty of the jallikattu game where then once you have tamed the bull you have, you can price out the prize money the coins that was the beauty of it so this would need people youth fundamentally who were having a good body a lot of strength who have trained themselves in wrestling and various other such forms of uh, combat so when you see some of these sports you can see that unless people have had this kind of training and exposure they cannot attempt these kind of sports and other acts as well so so look at the clear hump of the look at the beautiful hump look at the size of the bull the strength of it this vrishaba has it's just a sort of ox or a bull it's a vrishaba look at the strength and look at this this is depicting this jallikattu from the harappa manjadhar times itself see this all people here uh, accosting the bull this one head here one head here here look at this people here all accosting the bull the hump of the bull look at this picture very clear look at this here this holding it by the horns literally holding holding it by the mind you the our sport is not to do with matador or the what you did in the roman circus you kill the bull after the event and had it as a meal no for us it was a divine animal of lord shiva where you only tamed it to show your your personal virility against a very virile bull and then we were able to succeed in that process it was also an exercise to keep the virility of the animal also yes the bull as well so the variety of uh, paintings we have of different people fighting different martial art forms and this particular varma kala which was banned obviously they, they, the british were mortally scared of what all we could do and if you, the modern game of kabaddi which is so popular now you have got a kabaddi league now all this emanates from the same martial art form absolute emanates from the same martial art form we have it's become a modern sport now and happily so because these are the traditional sport of india no kabaddi is getting national recognition soon it should get even like international recognition that's how it has come up and not only did they practice these sort of arts on land they practiced on water too with their boats they used to they used to balance between boats and so that was a so boats were used only for fishing or traveling it was also used for art forms for martial art forms that's the beauty of it so they used to, so look at this particular the way you have malkam the beautiful sport of malkam in maharashtra in other parts of india too you had this where you have to climb the very slippery uh, pole and look at here there are coins here gold coins here tied at the top just the way they did for the bull here also they have and they put oil so this became slippery in spite of it you have to climb slipping oil pouring oil on you have to climb up to go pick up the coins the way you have this in bombay okay for janmashtami you have this famous uh, festival and other parts of india too so look at this so they kept the body and mind fit through the land to different festivals too that's the beauty of it that they did and there are different ways of doing it and and for the children before they trained us they had this sort of games to train the children to get into this and the finger nip, nimbleness you got so you had a range of sport through which you could do and get people to be nimble in mind in fingers in physical body everything 
Now, it was not only here. You had this in Manipur too. We'll show you some example. And we'll show you an example from Karnataka the next 10 minutes. See, Manipur is very, very interesting land, okay? It has given rise to two of the, it's the home, the origin for two very popular sports of the world today. One is polo and the other is field hockey. And both of them are ball and stick game. Even though polo first you associate it with the horse, it is actually fundamentally a ball and stick game. You are playing that sitting on a horseback. And uh, this ball and stick game, and similarly, if you look at hockey again, it is a ball and stick game. So the word for ball and stick game is kangje in Manipuri language. So kangje, a ball and stick, gave rise to two major games. One is Sagol Kangje, which is Polo. It also had a local name, Pulu, from which it comes as Polo. This is there in our mini book, uh, Manipur. Uh, on Manipur, you will see that again on the website uh, in under mini books. And uh, field hockey comes from Mukna Kangje. Now, the word Mukna and that, that actually gives rise to this field. Their game used to be called Mukna Kangje, from where they modified the rules to come up with the way we play hockey today. And uh, here is where you can see what is this Mukna Kangje, how they are playing it with their uh, stick. See, so simple, so the kind of... Puris, so, century ago, few centuries ago. So, this is their kind of stick, so similar to the hockey stick. And Mukna Kangje, the, the word Mukna is a martial art. It is a form of wrestling. And this Mukna Kangje, the rule was very uh, kind of similar to hockey, but slightly variant in that you could carry the ball and you could take it, but only when it is hit by the stick, it becomes a goal. Otherwise, it is not a goal. So you could take the ball and you could... Uh, handle it in different forms, either with your feet or hand, that is all right. But only if you hit it with the stick, it becomes a goal. On the other hand, for the opponent, they could tackle the person carrying the ball and prevent him from taking the ball near the goal. And they would use wrestling techniques. So here you can see them, the opponents tackling them using wrestling techniques. So, so that is Mukna. Look at this, they are holding them by the waistband. And literally lifting them up. See, so yeah. in sumo, how you do it? No, in sumo wrestling, Japan used the waistband to use this very similar to that. Using the waistband of the person to hold the person. And then you, you play the rule. So look at this. So we have given a variety of games. The, the international game polo that's played so much in USA and all of us. Many people wear the polo t-shirt. It comes from our Manipuri game called the ball was called Pulu. This ball was called Pulu from which comes the word Polo. Actually, it was a British officer by name Sherer who saw this game being played here and took it to West. That's what we, we, we explained that in our book, how it happens and how these games are played. Very clearly, a game from our proud northeast of Bharat, the land of Manipur. Mani itself means gem. The, the town, Nagara, the area of the gem. The money. So, these two are gems of the land that we have, that we have shown you. Now, I will just show you one more, uh, one or two more things. Um, so, we have told you this all there in our book to read for all of you. First, because there's lots to say. So, they also talk about Mukna being, uh, going back and Kangje kind of games, going back to Mahabharata times. And that means that goes back to about at least 5,000 odd years ago. So, this again, you see that uh, throughout the land, some form or the other, of okay. keeping uh, fit. And all of us will do it from Manipur will come down south to Karnataka. All of you are well aware that the Vijayadashmi festival in Mysuru Palace is so well known, popular. So, in, in the Mysuru Dasara festival, look at this a famous festival is the Dasara festival of Mysuru, where all the festivities happen outside the palace. For people to see, there's only one particular festival of the traditional wrestling that happens inside the palace courtyard itself, where the Raja, Yuvaraja, and all of them take part in it along with the royal, with the royal wrestlers. Look at them. 
this is a black and white photo era of the royal restlessness this is inside the palace courtyard this is inside the palace even today that even happens and you can see if you go on a uh, visit to the mysore palace they will show you this courtyard where uh, the wrestling uh, events take place during the sera look at this this is the palace happen this happening in the, inside the palace wrestling is an event this part of the dasara celebration so and look at the name they give vajra mushti so this is the one remember we uh, look at his hands they they hold uh, certain uh, weapons or claws with which again they can fight it's so, actually what he's holding is the antlers the, the deer the antlers horn that's what they're holding in their hand see but as you can see that they're holding it in their hand the strong deer antlers horn so it's called vajra mushti kala that's what they're holding the hand beautifully so and where did this come from before it came to the mysore palace it was in the krishnadevaraya kingdom where it was there so they, the krishnadevaraya kingdom had it so there was a practice there a great practice look at this both men and ladies to practice it look at the the hairstyle bun of the lady you can clearly see it was ladies not just the men even the ladies were experts in it look, look at the where one leg is where look at the other leg is she is lifted up you know beautiful sculpture going back a thousand years look with the with the lady with the bun hair hair style how is being done see and this is the dibba it's called the baha navami dibba it's now there in uh, hampi this is the the great baha navami dibba on which lot of royal events used to happen including this particular mal yuddha showcasing of all these arts art forms. skills of course used to have fireworks also here mal yuddha here for people to watch the the royalty like krishnadevaraya and his predecessors and people after him to watch from here so this was it was called a maha navami dibba dibba means platform on dashara the one day before dashara was was maha navami for that so this was so it's been an art form that has been practiced in india from parshurama times coming all the way down we have shown you different examples in different parts of it we have shown you malkam we have shown you this and the akadas that have kept up the tradition for us so uh, uh, different forms of this tradition all so in this. bengal bangladesh and all you have lati kela bihar you have fighting again with swords so they are called different things but the idea fundamental idea is good body movements balance postures footwork fitness and using weapons such as sticks or uh, certain uh, small uh, weaponry handheld weaponry or swords and slight differences in movements or uh, techniques and footwork and it gets a different name but underlying you will see a lot of commonality similarity and the ethos that you have to keep your body fit in order to be able to also protect your civilization and society at any time so this is uh, fundamentally you can see and and interestingly see here there is a divinity itself in maharashtra they have a form of shiva who is called khandoba and uh, you know you will have the sword fighting in bihar it's called pari khanda 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 means sword khadga you have a work on khadga lakshana so look at so many things that have to come together for a martial art with a sword to really flourish while on one side you need a lot of knowledge about ayurveda and all of things about keeping fit then about the art form footwork dance grace balance you also need metallurgy to be able to manufacture very good swords so you have about the khadga the sword that is needed for this art form you will find that in another text called khadga lakshana uh, which has been written on how to ma uh, manufacture how to make these kind of very good sword what is a lakshana of a good sword so all of this so today if we have to bring back this art form so so for all this there is an article written called uh, need the color articles available in our blog and uh, the mini books and films also available in our website for you to go and take it and use it the way you deem fit for the sessions and uh, we have to now as focusing on iks 
start bringing all this knowledge from various disciplines because now today sport has become a separate discipline itself so we have to now pick it up pick up all the related information from various aspects and then make a holistic knowledge base which teaches the martial art which teaches about the uh, uh, excellence that is needed in other disciplines as well to help these martial arts flourish and at the same time how to also impart the necessary values to the people who are getting trained in martial arts because now they're going to really have raw power in their hands and raw power can be dangerous unless you know how to control it so more than teaching martial arts you can teach martial arts but equally important it is to teach the soft art of value spirituality because without your spiritual practices your martial art will not be that kala that it is meant to be it will just be a pure just a sheer form of violence if it has to be a kala if it has to be an act with a purpose with an objective then you need that spiritual tenor to it you also need to need it to be bound by dharma and the values of dharma which are equally important in imparting this kind of uh, training point thank you dr hari and dr hema hari your knowledge and sessions are so simple and so enchanting we have been hearing you for so many years wonderful i think we can take a couple of questions thank you my name is giridhar i am from karnataka yes. recently we uh, heard about the national games on malakamba going on in gujarat thanks to all of your efforts we very happy to see such things happening and uh, i just want to know is there any links for the living kalari schools in kerala and uh, overall how do you see the future of these martial arts in india thank you thank you sir uh, for a very pertinent question yes we are glad that uh, uh, now it's not getting part of the national sport and in, in, it's not any more called only rural sport earlier you had something called rural sports and a uh, modern sport so it's all getting coming together today and equal importance is being given for this and yes there are very many centers because when Lord Parshama started 108 centers. Unfortunately, due to the travails of time, some of the centers have become very small. Now, with the new researchers over the last uh, in New India, many of the centers are now they are finding oxygen to come back and perform once again. Which is what one of the shot in arm was recognizing one of the lady practitioners for which she was even awarded the Padma Shri in, in Kalari, which we showed you. So, like that, many more people are getting recognized and. we have to not see kalari as you asked a minute back in the question should not be seen only as a separate art form it has to be co joined with ayurveda today ayurveda is seeing pun punarjeevan happening as you said about madhvastan ayurveda everything no so uh, the whole thing has to intertwine and come up because you cannot do kalari without ayurveda or you cannot do yujutsu without that so it is all intertwined so that is what is to come as a holistic perspective and take it to national and one area where it can happen is the indian army the national defense academy is now looking at opening up and taking more and more of this so since we have two special speakers from the services this uh, afternoon we can again bring it up with them so it has to be multi pronged attack yes it's happening the there's a window is open some fresh air is coming but we need to open lot more windows to get lot more fresh air and a good intertwining of the two because the traditional art forms of india have enormous value and as dr hema said it must not be looked at only as physical combat it is also got to do the mental upbringing as i said no earlier the gurus used to teach marmastana kala only when they the fed the students were fit enough to learn it like that there are levels and layers to it that is a bit and the intertwining is absolutely important between the stula and the sukshma the physical and the subtle that is what is important and this is what we have to get across also otherwise western art form is only gross physical stula the sukshma is not so much there whereas we have a good mix of both at a happy cogent mix of both that is what we have to look for and bring forth from our indian perspective our eastern perspective our dharmic perspective i want to know i want two questions madam first how bodhi yeah. dharma was died first question how bodhi dharma was died second one 
ప్లీజ్ ఎక్స్ప్లెయిన్ అబౌట్ ద కత్తి సాము వన్ ఆఫ్ ద మార్షల్ ఆర్ట్ ఇన్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ కత్తి సాము ఎస్ రైట్ ఎస్ కత్తి సాము హౌ బోధి ధర్మ టైప్ సి బోధి ధర్మ ఆబ్వియస్లీ హీ పాస్డ్ అవే ఇన్ చైనా సో హిస్ లాస్ట్ డేస్ వర్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ సి దిస్ see the multiple stories to it so whatever we hear is only from a chinese version not from our version not from indian version one of the versions is that he probably wanted to at the end of his life return back to his native kingdom he wanted to come back probably people did not want him to leave they wanted his body so probably one view is one story is that again so folk tale folk tale one this is probably they poisoned him so that his body will remain in china his skills will remain in china with them that could be one thing or probably to old age because he actually went when he was quite old when he went from here itself he was quite old he was well past the 60s probably his early 70s when he went so he was not a youngster in his 20s 30s going because he was a prince lived here traveled all over south india then he went to nalanda practice and he came back traveled all over the land it's only finally at the much later stage of his life that he set sail from mamallapuram all the way and he didn't go straight to chennai he went from here to sri lanka spent some time in sri lanka then he went to vietnam then he went to uh, southeast china then he went to interior china so he did take a few years to travel and his one of his brothers also joined him a couple of years later so there is a big all the explained in the book uh, in the mini book called bodhi the point is there for free read in our website so uh, how the end is obviously you only hear the local story which also multiple uh, detailing but it suffice to say that he spent his last days in china and he is not only while he was born in the pallava kingdom was a pallava prince he has become an international figure a figure who gave rise to a whole series of martial arts for the whole of eastern part of the world which has also taken the west by storm because it was not only physical but it was also mental and spiritual he mix it was intertwined of the two that's the beauty of it that is what we need to take the larger lesson over after 1500 years of his time yeah and uh, coming to uh, kathi samu and kara samu and all so fundamentally like i said at one point in time all the martial arts the base seems to be very common it's about footwork it's about learning the art of uh, Uh, giving that bounds to your body being able to jump uh, so uh, the body movement the focus on your body which is why we spent a little time in that kerala where they taught about mei payat they call by different names but that the fundamental thing is learn to control your body control your limbs give a sense of lightness to your body once you learn that then it is a matter of uh, handling different kinds of weapons and these fundamentally are stick and then those kind of uh, horns or claws and nails or daggers and swords so the shape of the sword can change it can be a two edge it can be a curved form of sword so that may change or it, the stick the thickness of the stick the length of the stick these can change but and maybe the rules of the when it is uh, fought as a game as a duel the rules may change uh here and there but largely you can club it as either with a stick which is karasamu and then kathi samu with a sword or whether you call it a lati kela or a karasamu or a silambam uh, they're all uh, similar uh, thing which are all grounded in the basic form of martial art uh, niyuddha kala of bharat which is also further grounded in the dharma yuddha the uh, idea of dharma yuddha the idea of dharma and all of that so the grounding is common and it's just the expressions are slightly different the names are slightly different in most of the dance based on topography based on the hydrology based on the climate you have to create variants that's the beauty of the land that's the diversity of land i said the base is the same the grounding is same the variants have to be there that's the beauty of it and to appreciate the beauty of the diverse because it's all topography based it's all hydrology based climate based the variants came about and they naturally grew they were organic in the grew from the land from that prithvi that's the beauty of it each of them is to be equally respected for the beauty they bring in 
see it also depends on the physical form of the person who is going to be performing that particular art form as well so different regions people's physique is slightly different and certain movements are possible not possible so accordingly they tailor and they come up with uh, a set of movements which are which become kind of a local art form she used the word one word see when you say tandem dance what is the beauty of dance i'm sure you have all seen many many dance performances how do you distinguish a good dancer the the there's a word in english l i t h like somebody who not like Light, light, who can move easily from one place to another. That distinguishes a good quality dancer. Similarly, in any of these martial forms, how good your footwork is to move. In cricket, batsman, what is important? The footwork in batting. In football, what is important? The footwork to move to the right place. In hockey, everything. So look at the, the way you move your body, how light you keep yourself body to move quickly. Artistically and beautifully, that's what matters. And that all comes not from the physical body alone, but that comes from the mind. How you train your mind, tune your mind to be calm. Only then it will come. The best of body cannot produce it sufficiently enough as, which is in synchronization with the mind. That's the beauty of our dharmic systems.